Since our speaker is talking about things in reference to children, we thought we would start out just doing a, a couple fun things with children's songs. So anyone who would like to stand with us, any Sunday school teachers, you know, that kind of thing, we're going to do some fun kids' songs for just a minute. <laughs> yes, please participate. <laughs> I have this spray. <laughs> I spray it in the throat. It helps you sing a little bit. So I took it out of my purse and I sprayed it. And I realized after I sprayed it, it was hand sanitizer. Oh! Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Stop and let me tell you what the Lord has done for me. Stop and let me tell you what the Lord has done for me. He forgave my sins and he saved my soul. He cleansed my heart and he made me whole. Stop and let me tell you what the Lord has done for me. Go and tell the story of the Christ of Calvary. Go and tell the story of the Christ of Calvary. He will forgive their sins, he will save their souls, he will cleanse their hearts, he will make them whole. Go and tell the story of the Christ of Calvary. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are His, the valleys are His, the stars are His handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do for you. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, Jesus died for you and me. H, I, J, K, L, M, N, Jesus died for sinful men. Amen. O, P, Q, R, S, T, U. I believe God's word is true. D and W, God has promised you. X, Y, Z, a home eternally. The B and the L, E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B, I, D, L, E, the B, I, D, L, E. I stand it along with me. I read and pray and then I pray to be ideally. This is the light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This is the light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine, let it Let it shine till Jesus comes, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I am a C, I am a C-H, I am a C-H-R-I-S-T-I-A-N. And I have C H R I S T in my H E A I T in I will L I B E E T E R N A L L Y. I am a C. I am a C H. I am a C H R I S T I A N. And I have C H R I S T in my H E A I T in I will L I B E E T E R N A L L Y.
Okay. okay. So, back to bow hunting. Last year, Carolyn, you missed it. I came in camouflage. So, they knew that there was some place else I was supposed to be, but I made I made this my priority. But and so we all thank you all for making this your priority today cuz this is going to bless your hearts. So Carolyn, if you would come and share your story. Good morning. There's a piece of wood in the way. I guess I put this here. Please pray with me. Father, you're here. Every atom of the air we're breathing is there because of you. And we pray that you would be glorified, that you would fill us with your spirit. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I wrote this all out, so I'm just going to read it. <clears throat> During COVID, I started writing down some of the things that the Lord has shown me in my years of working with children. I've brought a couple of my books with me today that you can look at later. One is called simply a book about death. And the other is called a book about divorce. No. <laughs> These are not books to be read for pleasure, obviously. They are to help families whose children are dealing with something really tough. I'm almost done with a fun picture book about Leviathan, the sea monster in the book of Job. And there's a fourth book in the works that is a collection of scripts for puppet shows. And to be honest, I'd much rather be talking about puppet shows today. I brought one of my little friends to get your hair out of your mouth. Oh boy, is it going to be a puppet show after all? No. Oh man. Okay. <laughs> I'd, be rather ta I'd rather be talking about puppet shows than about the suffering of children. But I told Carol Davis that the only way she could get me to stand up in front of a group of adults was if I could talk about my books. And the book about puppets isn't quite ready yet. So here we go. People often say I have a gift with children, but I think it's more a matter of years of walking with the Lord years of experience with children, rather than any particular gifting. At this point in time, and especially with the last year or so of COVID, I haven't been as free to work with children, so I started writing. But if you want to receive a gift from the Lord, just spend time with him. The time spent with him is the greatest gift of all. And the blessing of introducing our youngest brothers and sisters to him is also very great. Just because they look adorable, and they are healthy, and they have decent manners, is no reason to assume that children are doing just fine on the inside. We have all known children who seemed to be doing just fine as little kids, and then went off the rails maybe even left Christianity at some point, and why? In my case, I was a victim of incest. Perhaps the worst kind of betrayal a child can experience. But to look at me when I was young, you would never have guessed. I went to church. I was a good student. I was polite. I had friends. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. When I am sharing Jesus with a group of children, I keep in mind that a sizable percentage of them have either experienced great suffering already or else they are going to before they reach adulthood. It's just a fact. 
The same thing is true of their mothers and their fathers and their grandparents. Since the dawn of mankind, children have suffered deeply. I'm not going to list all of the rotten things that can happen to children because you already know. Instead, let's look together at why this has to be and what Jesus provides for these kids and how we all can be more effective in their lives to point them to their Savior. I want to make it very clear that I'm not going to try to guilt you into volunteering to be a Sunday school teacher. The children that I am thinking of today are the ones you know. You already know them. They're perhaps in your own family, maybe a neighbor child. God has given you a circle of acquaintance that includes some children. Our culture has a bad habit of being sentimental about childhood. We describe it to ourselves as a time of innocence, of play, a carefree absence of responsibility. We focus on their cuteness. We find them amusing. Even when they're being brats, we laugh at their antics, as long as we don't have to live with them. I do find the transparent, unsophisticated honesty of children refreshing. I enjoy spending time with them as they discover the miraculous world that God has made. I love their curiosity and their energy, their affection and their openness. I love teaching them. But the truth is, children left to themselves are little egotists. We are all born self-centered. Children can be amazingly self-righteous. They can be impatient, manipulative, cruel, and greedy. We get annoyed, especially if we forget they are born in sin, and their hearts, just like ours, are deceitfully wicked. Children may be naive, they may be ignorant, but they are never innocent. No one has to teach them to be selfish. And it's not helpful to them to be shamed for being selfish, to be made to feel ashamed for something they are helpless to amend. I just lost my place. When I talk to children about our sin nature, I talk about the me monster inside of each of us. And I have found that children never contradict me. They always understand. I ask them if they know when it begins. And we laugh together about their baby brothers and sisters who howl in rage when they don't get their own way. Oswald Chambers wrote that sin is something I am born with and cannot touch. Only God touches sin through redemption. But the way we explain sin to children can be crushing if we're not careful. When I was a child, my mother took me to a Sunday school where I was taught the Ten Commandments. I was told if I obeyed them and attended church regularly, I would go to heaven when I died. That was cold comfort to me. Because the burden, the secret monstrosity that I carried, remained on and in me. The Jesus they told me about was away somewhere. And God was looking down. And it was on me to be a sunbeam for him. I was glad you guys didn't sing that song this morning. <laughs> That's a bad song if you read it carefully. It's all about works. I was never taught that I was born crippled, that I had inherited a sin nature from Adam and Eve. I was never told that Jesus had given his life to save me here, not just to go to heaven when I died, I needed a savior right then, in this life. I needed to be saved from the crippling self-centeredness of my race. One of my grandchildren, aged, at age three, came down to breakfast one morning and announced that he had decided what he wanted to be when he grew up. This was normal, although the job description changed frequently. On this day, however, he had decided to be God. 
My son's a pastor, so you can imagine. <laughs> and when his parents asked him the reason, he said, because then he could be in charge. I love the way Oswald Chambers explains our sin nature. He calls it my claim to my right to myself. He wrote, the nature of sin is not immorality and wrongdoing, but the nature of self-realization, which leads us to say, I am my own God. Sisters, our culture has been promoting self-realization for over 150 years, and we should not be surprised at its fruit. The latest fashion of transgender self-mutilation is not at all surprising, really. It goes right along with my claim to my right to myself. But God, have mercy on us who know better if we keep silent. One of my friends gave me another description of our sin nature that helped her when she was young. She says, it's what I want when I want it. And for slightly older children who have learned about the Trinity, I mention the unholy Trinity of me, myself, and I. They get it. I ask the children to look at one another and say, it's all about me. We laugh, but they understand very well where that leads. I want you to try it now. Look at me and tell me. It's all about me. One, two, three. It's all about me. Now look at each other and say it. Now we're laughing because it is so absurd. <clears throat> but without Jesus to save us and change our hearts, that is our world. A teacher friend observed to me once, <clears throat> we spend the first two years teaching children to walk and talk and the rest of their childhood trying to get them to sit down and shut up. <laughs> How many of you were teachers? <laughs> Speaking of teachers, I should give you a little more of my backstory here. I'm 66 years old with a chicken neck. My grandkids love to play with my chicken neck. <laughs> I'm a retired algebra teacher, but I started out as a child. And at a very young age, my grandfather raped me. All kinds of trouble came from that. Trouble from the betrayal of trust. Trouble from the physical violence, the sexual violence. As I grew, I had nightmares too horrible to share with anyone but I also had trouble because of my sin nature and being in the dark spiritually. I am forever grateful that God did not leave me there. When I was 16, I met my boyfriend's mother who started telling me about Jesus. At first I thought she was a harmless lunatic. Yeah, this was in the 70s and she'd say, do you know Jesus loves you and has a plan for your life? You remember that? Those of you that grew up know the 70s? Yeah, that was, a, that was a thing, right? There'd be a bumper sticker. But she was also quite friendly and sincere, and what she told me about Jesus got under my skin. And then the Lord gave me no peace. He was relentlessly drawing me to himself, and just before my 19th birthday, he revealed himself to me quite tangibly in answer to a half-hearted prayer. Somehow or other, most of us here found out about Jesus from another person. Someone took the risk of rejection, took the trouble of making sure we knew. Somebody told us that Jesus is much more than a dead historical figure. Jesus, the crucified and resurrected Savior of mankind? In my case, it was my mother-in-law, since my boyfriend and I got married soon after I was saved. 
Of course, I was not a child by then. I don't think my mother-in-law really ever understood how important her witness was to me. Meeting Jesus not only saved my soul for eternity, but it literally saved my physical life as well. By the time I was 16, when I met her, I was living a double life. I had a severe eating disorder. I was promiscuous. I was addicted to pornography. I was a thief, and I was a drug user. Suicide was never far from my thoughts, although I was careful never to share that with anyone. The strain of keeping up a facade of normalcy was beginning to break me. I knew I must never live to be an adult, never marry, never have children, and I didn't know why exactly, but I was quite certain I wanted no part of the future of the human race. There, I said it. <laughs> I've never shared my testimony with more than one person at a time. <laughs> I sent this, I, my husband read this ahead of time, he said it was okay to share, and, and then I shared it with my son, who's a pastor, he said it was okay. <laughs> anyway, right, near, right here, I'd like to draw your attention to a familiar story in the Bible. It's found three times, in Luke, in Mark, and in Matthew, and I'll read you the passage in Matthew, chapter 18. And Jesus, calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly I say to you, Unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Do you notice how harsh that is? Why is Jesus so harsh here? And why is the same story recorded three times in the four Gospels? I want to suggest to you that we misunderstand often this passage in one very important way. We, with our sentimental view of childhood as a time of innocence, we look at this passage and we frown with disapproval at the corruption of the child. But we stop there. We ignore the fact that the child's sinful heart is fertile soil for evil to take root. And that, I believe, is why Jesus is so harsh Children are sitting ducks for temptation. They need Jesus every bit as much as we older people do. Not just to go to heaven when they die. They need him now. One of the reasons I am so determined about sharing Christ with children, in particular, is because I have seen firsthand what happens to a child who endures suffering without him. I was very young when my grandfather molested me. He left me very confused, feeling dirty and ugly and responsible somehow, and very perversely sexualized. My grandpa started me on a trajectory that would have destroyed me if Jesus had not intervened. How do we deal with stories like mine? We can get angry at God for allowing children to be abused. We can complain to God when children suffer for the sins of adults, or from sickness, or any of the other rotten things that happen to them. We can shake our fists in the air. Sometimes that is actually helpful during the grief process 
and I've been there. Years ago, I was very angry with God for letting my daughter get raped by a neighbor who was also a respected local pastor. So in some ways, her situation was even worse than mine. Why does God let things like that happen? Job was so angry with God for letting Satan kill off all his children. And the only answer Job got, the only answer we get in this life is, trust me. That can be cold comfort. Perhaps we will reject him then and say, as one of my ancestors did, any God who would let such bad things happen is no God of mine. I want to suggest, though, that we look at another story, the story of Lazarus for help. If you know the story, Jesus deliberately delayed coming to help when Mary and Martha sent word to him that Lazarus was sick. Jesus let Lazarus die. He even waited until the body was stinking before he visited Bethany, where Mary and Martha lived. Jesus knew what he was going to do. He could have been smug like a cat that swallowed a canary. He knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, but he also understood Mary and Martha. And he cried with them. Why? The Bible says he wept bitterly, not just a few sentimental tears. Jesus wasn't mourning the death of Lazarus. And one night, a long time ago now, but I couldn't sleep often. I had a lot of problems sleeping when I was younger. And I was angry, and I was so confused. And I was crying out to God, just like Mary and Martha. Where were you when we were suffering? Why did you let this happen? And God directed me to read this story, which I thought I knew. I had read it before, but I had missed something. I had never noticed that Jesus knew and felt how hard it was for Mary and Martha. He cared enough to cry with them. My heart was deeply healed that night, and I have never forgotten it. When the Lord allows suffering, we are never alone. He always provides for us. He provides that one thing needed to survive and even to give him glory in the midst of the suffering. He provides himself. John wrote about Jesus, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. We cannot prevent suffering in this life, either for ourselves or for others. What we can do, what we must do, is make sure people know about the light of our Savior. The comfort that only he can provide, the assurance that our suffering is not random or pointless, is from him. And it's not our fault that we are born in the dark and need a Savior. Mary and Martha were reluctant to have the stone rolled away at first. Did you ever notice that? They knew how bad it was going to stink. There's a little plug for your healing journey. <laughs> it's OK if it stinks, girls. But did you ever notice? How long Jesus prays after the stone is rolled away? He gave everyone time to smell that stench before he called Lazarus to come out. Most of us 
have dead spots in our hearts that stink. Those of us who suffered as children in the dark may have some really festering wounds. Only Jesus can give us the confidence to roll the stone away and let him heal us. <clears throat> I brought my books in case you want to take a look at them. Um, and I also brought some books that I use a lot when I'm um, sitting with a child or a group of children. Um, that's a, if you're not sure where to start, read them a story. There's some really incredible children's books out there now, much better than when I was growing up. Um, picture books that will bring the gospel deep into the child. And if it's, you know, on your couch, in your house, on, at their house, on the couch, read them a story. Um, the books I brought have um, really good help in them for the reader to answer questions that the child might have. Um, the books I wrote are the same. They're in intended to be read with the child, so you don't hand it to the child and send them off to read the book alone. In closing, I would like you to join me in a song that I always teach when I am with children, and you already know it, but today I would like you to teach, I'd like to teach you the sign language for it. Children retain a message much better if they move around a little bit. Sign language brings in a different layer of their memory and their intelligence um, and helps the words of the song go deeper. So I, I loved what you guys were doing with your signs. Um, but we got to get the kids moving too. So um, the, here's the words. Jesus, touch your wrists. Loves, hug yourself. Me, point to yourself. This I know, two fingers on your forehead. For the Bible, make a book. Tells me so, two fingers coming away from your lips. Little ones, to him, belong, pull that in, that's right. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes is a head nodding. I always thought this looked like a, someone knocking on a door, but it's supposed to be a head nodding. Yes, Jesus loves me. Okay? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Did I do good? Is that half an hour? They told me I had to talk for half an hour. Is that, did I, I'm okay, I'm done, yay. <laughs> You're welcome. Caroline, thank you very much. That was a powerful testimony. And thank you for being brave enough to share it. And you, and we never know when there might be somebody that needed to see here exactly those words. So thank you. Thank you.